Hi, I'm Chetan Nayak, and I lead quantum hardware development at Microsoft. Thanks for tuning in today to hear about some of the team's exciting new results. I recently recorded a webinar, and if you're looking for a high-level view of our program, I encourage you to view that webinar. Today, what I'm going to be doing is walking through a paper we just published in Physical Review B. In this paper, we demonstrated that we've engineered devices in which we can controllably induce the topological superconducting phase, supporting Majorana zero modes. This is an essential step on the path to a new type of protected qubit. To start out, let's step back and think about the motivation here. I mean, why are we really trying to build a quantum computer? In the hype surrounding quantum computing, people often say quantum computers are going to solve all kinds of problems like predicting the stock market or curing cancer. But our analysis shows that quantum computers will actually be useful for small data big compute problems. Because big data problems are going to take much too long just to load the information into a quantum computer. And moreover, the problem needs to have a quantum algorithm with super polynomial speed up relative to the best known classical algorithm. Otherwise, the point at which the quantum computer will overtake the classical computer will be at such large problem sizes that it's not relevant. So we're really focused on problems where we can make an impact with a quantum computer, particularly to problems of societal importance. And that leads us to problems in chemistry and material science. Those aren't niche problems. In fact, 96% of all manufactured goods rely on chemicals and material science, and those things have an impact on 100% of humanity. So we can, in fact, make progress on many of these problems today, taking advantage of high-performance computing in the cloud. However, the most difficult of these problems are going to require a quantum computer. And so it behooves us to think about what kind of resources are needed in order to solve these problems, how big of a quantum computer, and how long should it run. And our resource estimator in Azure Quantum allows anyone to go in and actually cost out what it takes to run their particular quantum algorithm uh, to solve their favorite problem. And the input data into that include, or the outputs include the number of qubits, the runtime, and so on. The types of problems that we're interested in, as you can see from this chart here, will require million or millions of qubits and a month or so of runtime. Although both of those can increase considerably if the qubits aren't sufficiently stable. Our approach at Microsoft to getting to the kind of scale that we need in order to solve these really important problems for humanity is based on topologically protected qubits. The idea here is to encode quantum information in the topological properties of certain states of matter, in much the same way that the information about presence or absence of a twist is encoded in the topological difference between a Merbius band and an ordinary strip. Topologically protected qubits and topological states are characterized by an energy scale delta, which you can think of as akin to just how hard do you have to work to tear open a Merbius band and reconnect it untwisted. That energy scale delta leads to, if it's large, to long decoherence times and high gate fidelities, but also to the ability to rapidly do operations and to have a small footprint. The catch is we have to be able to reproducibly create a topological phase of matter in our devices. And when we think about that problem, there are two key challenges. The first is disorder destroys the topological phases. If a device or material gets too dirty, it will be impossible for it to support a topological phase. The topological phase will be destroyed, and a trivial phase will result. So it's really important for us to know what is the tolerable level of disorder beyond which a topological phase won't be supported. And that depends on the particular materials and the particular device design. And then secondly, once we know what that target is, we need fabrication processes that are capable of beating that target. Second problem is, even if we do manage to solve that problem, it's difficult to detect topological phases. Generally speaking, the fractional quantum Hall effect, which is the best known topological phase, is the exception that proves the rule. There, there's a bulk invariant transport property that is a topological invariant, but that's not the case. In general, the things that we measure don't directly correspond to topological properties that we would use to diagnose a topological phase. So we need some model of our device that can connect the things we measure to the top underlying topological properties. The good news is, if we have such a model, then simulated data can enable us to test that connection between the measurable quantities and the quantities of greatest interest to us. So with that background, 
let's look at the particular topological phase of matter and the particular device type that we've been working with here at Microsoft. The particular topological phase of matter that we're focused on here at Microsoft is topological superconductivity and nanowires. Here is, on this slide, a simplified model of this state of matter. And what we have here schematically depicted is a semiconductor nanowire in contact with a superconducting layer mediated through a barrier. On the top right, what we have is the energy spectrum of the bottom of the conduction band. And what we have in the bottom left is a model Hamiltonian for a single subband nanowire with Rashba spin orbit coupling and in a magnetic field along the wire. There are several terms in this model. The first is a large spin orbit coupling, where for us large means larger than around four MeV nanometers. What that does is it splits the bottom of the conduction band into two helicity resolved bands with a crossing. When we turn on a magnetic field along the wire, that crossing is resolved and provided the G factor is large, where large for us means larger than 10, 10 in the range 10 to 50, then a relatively mild magnetic field actually opens a big gap there. So it's mild enough that it doesn't disrupt the superconductivity in the superconductor layer too much. And then if we have control over the density, then we can park the density at a, at a location and energy such that there's, one, there's two Fermi crossings, one of positive and one of negative momentum. And then in that circumstance, if we have good contact with the superconductor, then the type of superconductivity that's induced is necessarily topological superconductivity. Here, blue denotes the, the trivial phase, red the topological phase, and I will consistently stick to that color scheme in the slides to follow, as we get, particularly as we get to more realistic models. So you can see here that in this relatively simplified single subband model, so this semiconductor is a single subband, as you increase the magnetic field or increase the Zeeman energy, you go through a phase transition from the trivial to the topological phase. In the trivial phase, the local density of states, and here on one axis we have energy, on the other axis you have position along the wire, the local density of states has the classic BCS form. This is what you see at low values of the magnetic field, where there's a gap, the superconducting energy gap, and below that gap there are no states in the wire. However, as we increase magnetic field or Zeeman energy, we go through a phase transition, which is that boundary between the blue and red regions. And on the other side of that phase transition, in most of the wire, we again have a gap to all energy states. But at the ends of the wire, we have these peaks in the local density of states right at zero energy. And those are our signatures of Majorana zero modes. So that's schematic and high level. Now let's look at the actual devices that we've been experimenting with. Here is a side view, cross-sectional view of one of our devices. These are devices, they're gate-defined superconducting nanowires built on uh, a semiconductor heterostructure in which the quantum well is indium arsenide. So you can see, going from bottom to top, we have a substrate, a buffer layer, and an indium arsenide quantum well. Then there's a barrier layer, and then there's a superconducting strip. This is a side view of a strip. The length of the strip, and therefore the length of the wire, runs into uh, the plane of the slide. And then above that, there's a dielectric and there's gates. And the combined effect of the superconductor, that superconducting strip and the gates, enables us through electric fields to define a nanowire as follows. When we energize those gates, which is to say put negative voltages on those gates, and here we call them plunger gates for reasons that'll be clear momentarily, as we energize those gates, we deplete the two-dimensional electron gas. So we deplete the electrons in the quantum well, in the indium arsenide quantum well, almost everywhere, except underneath the aluminum wire. The aluminum wire partially screens the electric fields due to the gates, and therefore the potential is different uh, on the sides in the two DAG that are uncovered by aluminum, and we deplete the uh, electron gas there, but we can leave some density underneath the aluminum. We have three plunger gates here, a central section, two outer sections, so that we can make the outer sections even more negative. And there we can, in fact, fully deplete even underneath the aluminum wire. So on the sides, you should think of this as just aluminum wires, and you can more or less ignore the semiconductor out to the sides. However, in the central section, we have this gate-defined nanowire in which we have some density of electrons underneath the aluminum. And in addition, we have two junctions over here where some gates uh, at zero or even positive voltage, bring some electron density out there so that we can run currents into and out of the wire and thereby measure transport properties. The plunger gate that I mentioned, the central section, which depletes the indium arsenide two-dimensional electron gas to the sides of the wire, 
also allows us the fringe remaining fields that are not completely screened by the aluminum allows us to tune the density underneath the wire so that we can get into the good regime where we can get to the topological phase. When we're in that regime and we apply a magnetic field along the wire, then the local density of states in the wire will take a form similar to what is depicted here and we get into the topological phase and then through transport measurements we can observe that local density of states and see directly the Majorana to zero modes. This is a schematic. Here is an SEM image of an actual device of this type. And we'll be talking soon about data from devices just like this. But now, with a specific concrete device design and type, we can revisit that phase diagram that I described a few slides ago. Here it is on the left side of this slide. Again, blue is trivial phase, red is topological phase. And this is the phase diagram of that model. Vx is the effective Zeeman energy mu, the chemical potential in the wire. Now, for the device design that I just described, we have a much more realistic and detailed phase diagram. The magnetic field is on the x-axis. That's the actual control parameter. The plunger gate voltage is on the y-axis. That is the actual applied voltage on that gate. And you can see the phase diagram looks more complicated. Again, blue means trivial phase. Red means topological phase, and there's an additional wrinkle here, which is that darker blue means larger bulk gap in the trivial phase, darker red means larger bulk gap in the topological phase, or larger topological gap for shorthand, and the pale colors in white signify very small bulk gap or even gapless systems. So you can see, first off, that there are multiple lobes of topological phase. Whereas on, in the simplified model, we had only a single subband in the semiconductor, now we have multiple subbands because it's not quite a purely one dimensional system, it's quasi one dimensional. And there can be subbands in the y direction, which is to say the direction within the two DAG perpendicular to the direction of the wire. In the z direction, which is the direction perpendicular to the, to the interface between the semiconductor and superconductor, we are in the lowest subband. So it's the subbands in this direction, in the lateral direction that we're talking about here. And you can see that we have a topological phase when we have one, three, five, or in principle, any odd number of those subbands. However, it's advantageous to be in the lowest subband. In particular, you can see that there are these white regions and even gap closings out at around you know, two and a half to three Tesla in the third and fifth subband. And those are there because of the orbital effect of the magnetic field. In our simple model, we only had the Zeeman energy. That was the only effect of the magnetic field. But in fact, the cross-sectional area is non-negligible. And at these values of the magnetic field, we can end up threading half of a flux quantum through that cross-section of the entire superconductor semiconductor barrier structure. So there really is a big advantage to being in the lowest subband. And in fact, you can see that the maximum topological gap is reached in that subband. One of the important design principles in our device design was to be able to get into that lowest subband. And you can see that from this phase diagram, this is indeed possible at pretty reasonable values of that plunger gate voltage, you know, in the range of between minus one and minus two volts. That's a function of how wide that wire is. And for that reason, we want our wires to be narrower than 120 nanometers. Okay, so that's the phase diagram for a completely clean system. It's Realistic in other ways, including the electrostatics, the orbital effects of the magnetic field, and so on, but it doesn't include the effects of disorder, which is the topic that we now turn to. So in the presence of disorder, what the electron sees in the nanowire is a random potential. So it scatters off this random potential. That potential, the contributions to it come from various imperfections and defects in the wire. If the disorder gets too strong, which is like the variation that random potential gets too large, it will strongly suppress the topological phase. And so in particular, the phase diagram, that simple parabolic lobe that we had of topological phase in the clean system, starts to become a little bit jagged. And you can see that actually, if you sweep through one way or the other, you might go through the topological phase and back to trivial and back to topological. Moreover, if we focus on just the regions where the gap is large, large enough to be distinguished from zero, then we just have these very small pockets. So disorder introduces very important both quantitative and qualitative changes to the phase diagram. The way you can think about this is, because of that random potential, you, you might say, hey, the, the local electrochemical potential is varying across the wire, and so in some regions it's topological, some regions it's trivial phase, and then the boundaries between them, we will have low energy states. 
And so we end up filling in the gap and nucleating regions of trivial and topological phase. As a result, and moreover, if we increase the disorder strength too much, eventually we'll wipe out the topological phase completely and the system will be just trivial. That occurs beyond a critical disorder strength, which is roughly at when the scattering time for the electrons to scatter off of these impurities underneath the aluminum uh, multiplied by the ideal clean system topological gap is of order one. Or equivalently, when the localization length under the aluminum is shorter than the clean system ideal coherence length. Once you get to that limit, the topological phase is destroyed in the thermodynamic limit. And so it's essential for us to have systems that are clean enough that we're on the other side of that threshold. Now, we've analyzed the microscopic underlying source of that disorder, which can be dislocations, uh, alloy disorder, bulk and interface charge defects. And what our analysis shows is that at these low densities at which we're operating the device, charge defects at the dielectric interface are the dominant source of scattering, they're the dominant source of disorder. So those white dots you see in the dielectric are representing charge defects in the dielectric. The device design has been optimized in order to keep, to the extent possible, the active region, which is in the indium arsenide quantum well underneath the aluminum, keep that active region as far as possible from those charge defects. The knobs we have to do that are, we can make the aluminum strip wider, and that keeps the charge defects and dielectric further away from the active region. However, we can't make it too wide because if we make it too wide, then we will not be able to deplete to the lowest subband. So there is a sweet spot there uh, where the, the width of the wire is wide enough that we're keeping the defects far away, but we can still deplete to the lowest subband. The second thing is there's the barrier thickness. By making the barrier thicker, again, we can keep the those charge defects further away. However, if the barrier is too thick, then it'll be very difficult to induce superconductivity into the quantum well. If we made the barrier extremely thick and had a very deep quantum well, it would hardly see those charge defects, but we wouldn't be able to induce superconductivity. So there's trade-offs here, and the design has been optimized to get the right wire width and the right barrier thickness to find the sweet spot within those trade-offs. And the target here is the density of those defects at the interface between the semiconductor and the dielectric needs to be less than around three times 10 to the 12th per centimeter squared. So that's kind of the, the magic number for us is to get uh, a dielectric deposition process or more generally a fabrication process that leaves behind less, preferably significantly less than that density of defects. Now, we test this, we've, we've developed our, our process by uh, um, by a variety of means and have tested it using hull bars from which we can extract that density of defects from analysis of the density dependence of the mobility. We verified that we are in this clean limit by modifying slightly our device in order to put four junctions on the device with different spacings between that junction so that within the same wire by measuring the transconductance between junction one and junction two, one and three, two and three, two and four, and so on, we can measure effectively the localization length underneath the aluminum by uh, looking at the length dependence of that transconductance. This is actual measured data. What we've done here is we've put a magnetic field perpendicular to the wire in order to suppress that induced gap to have more signal at low bias voltage. And you can see there's a significant transconductance across the device at one micron, and really even going all the way up to eight micron long wires. So that is an indication of just how clean these devices are and the fact that we have gotten to a, a limit in which the density of charge defects is rather low. We can fit that length, de length dependence as such, and you, we extract a localization length that's a function of plunger gate voltage, which means it's, it's a localization as a function of the density in the wire. The higher the density in the wire, the longer that localization length is because the higher density can better screen those charge defects. As we get into the lowest subband and get closer to depleting the lowest subband, the localization length does get shorter, but it's still longer than a micron. And we expect the clean ideal coherence length in the topological phase to be half that or even less. So this is a really good regime to be in, and this is direct evidence that we have very clean wires in accordance with what we expect based on those hull bar measurements. Our localization length is longer than micron, so these are very, very clean wires. We believe that we've solved that problem of getting clean devices 
that disorder was the enemy. We've made progress on that. Now, the second piece of the puzzle is, how can you tell if you're in the topological phase, how are you going to determine what phase you're in? There's an easy situation, or I should say there's kind of a textbook case in which when you have a new phase of matter in a solid, it just jumps out at you. Like high temperature superconductivity, they cool it down, the resistance just went to zero. Or the fractional quantum Hall, or integer and fractional quantum Hall effects, where there was just a, uh, a quantized conductance, the, or the Hall resistance was quantized. So it just jumps out at you in, directly in the data. But that's not always the case. It isn't always the case, even when there's very important issues at stake or fundamentally new phases of matter, it doesn't actually always jump out at you. Here is the measurement in which the Higgs boson was found. And you can see, without that yellow line there, which comes out of simulations and an understanding of what the background should be, it would be very hard to detect from the raw data where the Higgs boson was. So we are lucky that we're not in as complicated as this, case as this, but we are somewhat of an intermediate case where we really de do need to understand what's going on in our, in our device in order to interpret the data. In particular, you know, we have a device that's sitting down in the bottom of a dilution refrigerator at 50 millikelvin or so, and we're going to apply both in the data I'm going to describe here and for more complex devices that are further out on our roadmap, we're going to be applying various kinds of control pulses, voltages, and going to be measuring various kinds of readout signals. And those aren't directly topological phases. So we need some model that connects the things that we measure to the universal properties that we want. Um, the topological gap protocol is one such model, or it's based on such a model, and lets us deduce where the topological phase is based on transport data, both local and non-local conductances. And when we consider more complicated things like fusion and braiding, it will similarly be essential to have um, this kind of model because we'll be applying various control pulses and doing readout signals. And we have to know that some parts of the device are in the topological phase, some parts in the trivial phase. And what we're doing is actually manipulating those Majorana zero modes and doing what we want to do and not doing something else. The way the topological gap protocol works is it's got two stages. Stage one focuses on the local conductances. So basically, you should think of this as the tunneling conductance into each of the ends of the wire. And what we're looking for is zero bias peak. So that's kind of schematically depicted there. You have a differential conductance GRR, which is the derivative of I at the right junction with respect to the voltage V at that junction. And you're looking for a peak at zero bias. And we want those to have peaks at both ends of the wire, because if the entire wire is in the topological phase, there should be Majorana and zero modes at both ends, and we want to have those peaks at both ends. But we also demand that those zero bias peaks be stable. Stable in particular with respect to local variations at two junctions. So by changing the junction transparency, we change the local electrostatics. There can be quantum dots, or there could be un trivial Andreev bound states that might accidentally form for some particular settings of the, of the junctions. So we want to vary what's happening at the junctions, make sure that those zero bias peaks at both ends remain stable. So that's what we're looking for. And on top of that, of course, this is a bulk phase of matter, so we should be able to change the density in the wire, which is equivalently change that plunger gate voltage and change the magnetic field. And as long as those changes aren't too large, those, state, those zero bias peaks should remain stable with respect to those kinds of changes as well. Okay, so that's stage one. And we use that to find in the bulk phase diagram interesting regions, which is to say interesting regions in the density and magnetic field space uh, where we have stable zero bias peaks at both sides. That allows us to narrow down our search space, okay, so that we don't end up in a situation of going and hunting for something and then, and then find the thing we want and stop there. No, we search a very large search space, find the promising regions, and then investigate further. And stage two takes the point of view of, okay, topological phases might be hard to detect, but the phase transition into them might actually be easier because it's associated with a gap closing. And so here, we focus in stage two on the non-local conductances, such as the derivative of I at the right junction with respect to the voltage at the left junction. These are, the main contribution to these are um, trajectories in which an electron tunnels into the wire and then goes out to the other junction, and so it's sensitive to the bulk gap. And in particular, if the bias voltage is above the parent gap of aluminum, then the electron will just tunnel into the aluminum and go to ground and give no signal here. If it's below the induced gap in the wire, you can't even get charge in. And so the signal is really peaked between the induced gap and the parent gap of aluminum. And as we increase magnetic field, if the induced gap 
decreases as it approaches the phase transition, we'll see that by a signal in the non-local conductance that instead of being zero below some induced gap value, that that goes lower and lower and lower until we see a gap closing. So we're looking for gap closings, we're looking for phase transitions. And then what we want to do is, having identified those phase transition or gapless regions, we then correlate that with where we have stable zero bias peaks. And if, if, they, if they do correlate, which is to say if we find regions in which we have stable zero bias peaks at both ends of the wire, surrounded by a gapless region and with a energy gap in the bulk within that stable zero bias peak region, then that's our candidate for the topological phase. And we can moreover extract what the size of the topological gap is from this measurement as well. So those are the steps in the topological gap protocol. So let's see how the topological gap protocol works on simulated data. So what we have here are bias field scans for a simulated device. And there's a movie that you see here, and what's happening in the movie is the junction transparencies are being varied, and also the plunger gate voltage that controls the density is being varied. We can feed that data into the topological gap protocol in the exact same way as we will with real experimental data. And what we see is the TGP produces a phase diagram. Here are two different representations of the same phase diagram. And what we see on the right side is a red pocket there where we have topological phase, surrounded by white regions where the gap is zero. And then towards the left side of that panel, we see the blue where we have trivial phase. On the other side, we compare the TGP output to the topological invariant. There's a hatched region in the phase diagram. And what that hatched region shows is where the topological invariant, which is a Z2 invariant, where it's equal to minus 1. Where it's plus 1, we have the trivial phase. And where it's minus 1, we have the topological phase. And what you can see here is the output of the TGP, the region which the TGP identifies as topological phase, is a subset of the region that uh, has topological invariant minus 1. There are other places where the topological variant is equal to minus 1, but those are actually not particularly useful re regions because you can see the gap is small there. This is one particular disorder realization in one device. We applied the TGP to a range of different simulated devices with slightly different designs and disorder strengths, and we classified the outputs as true positives if the TGP found a region of topological phase which where the topological variant is minus one, and false positive if, if, if the output was a region that, in fact, is not topological because the topological variant is plus one. And to find a false discovery rate, which is the probability that the TGP finds or claims to find a topological phase where, in fact, there is none as far as the topological invariant is concerned. And what you can see is we didn't have any false positive outcomes, even though we varied disorder strengths from 0.1 times 10 to the 12th per centimeter squared, all the way up to 4 times 10 to the 12th per centimeter squared. So from a statistical perspective, that means that the false discovery rate can be bounded at the 95% confidence level at less than 8%, and in most cases, less than 5%. Let's go to the topological gap protocol applied to experimental data on real devices. And the punchline, I'll give away the punchline right now, which is that we're routinely producing devices that have a topological phase. Here is an SEM image of a device in the topological phase. That's where the Majorana zero modes would be at the two junctions. And the topological gap is the energy gap measured in the bulk of that device through transport. And here's the phase diagram, the experimentally obtained phase diagram for this device. There's a pocket you can see on the far right panel. That's identified by the TGP as topological phase. That's where we have zero bias peaks at both ends of the device that are stable. In the bulk, there's a gap. And then the surrounding region you see is white. That's where the system is gapless. You can see over on the, uh, in the middle that other depiction or other representation of the same phase diagram. So you can see the regions where there's stable zero bias peaks and a, and a bulk gap. There are also regions where there's stable zero bias peaks, but it's gapless. And there are other regions where it's stable zero bias peaks, but it's not surrounded by a gap closing and reopening. So there are other regions there with interesting physics, which if you only looked at the local conductances and only looked at you know, zero bias peaks, you would actually be misled. So that's one example of why it's so important to have both the local and non-local conductances. The maximum topological gap, by which I mean the maximum value is the top quintile, is defined as the top quintile of gap values that we measure within the topological region. For this device, it's about you know, 22, 23 microvolts. The area of the topological phase is a multiple 
of that topological gap squared. So you might look at this and say, well, boy, that's a small pocket. It's, you know, it's only a few, you know, one or two millivolts in size and plunger gate voltage, and it's a few hundred millitesla. Why is it so small? But in fact, it's not small. In energy units, it's several times, you know, it's a multiple of the size of that gap squared, which is about what we expect it to be. Now, the underlying data from which this phase diagram is derived looks like this. The, there's these color plots on top and then waterfall plots below. They're both representations of the exact same bias field scans. And what you see on the phase diagram in the bottom corner is there's a horizontal line and a vertical line. And this is what the data looks like on that cut through that horizontal line. So that's a fixed value of the plunger gate voltage. What we're changing here is magnetic field and bias voltage, okay? In the paper, there's also data on that vertical scan. And what you can see is, you see gap closing, it reopens that you see in the non-local conductances, and the local conductances, you see zero bias peaks in the, appearing in that region after the gap is reopened. You see the same, same, it's exact same data in the color plots as well as the waterfall plots. In the waterfall plots, you, you see gap closing and reopening and the appearance of zero bias peaks on the two ends of the wire. So this is, exactly what we expect the topological phase to look like for systems like this at these disorder levels. It's similar to the data that we've seen in our simulations. Uh, but just to be clear, our confidence in this comes not from some visual similarity with, with what's in simulations, although there is. It comes out of the fact that we fed this into the topological gap protocol analysis script, and it found that phase diagram that we have over there. And that TGP analysis had no false positives when tested against, again, a variety of different uh, designs and disorder strengths. So we then did something a little bit risky, which is we took this device, which we call device A, we warmed it up, took it out of the dilution refrigerator, put it in a different dilution fridge, and cooled it down. And we remeasured it. And in fact, it was remeasured by a different group of people. And what we saw is it again passed the topological gap protocol. The phase diagram changed a little, as you might expect, because when we thermally cycle these devices, even though the average disorder strength, which is that density of charge defects, remains around the same, the particular disorder configuration where all those impurities are located does change a little bit. So when we cooled it down, we got a slightly different phase diagram, but the maximum topological gap was actually larger in this case. It's closer to 30 microvolts. The area of the topological phase is still around a multiple of that maximum gap squared. So then we measured it again a week later, and a week later, again, there had been some movement of those charges driven by the sweeping in the gate voltage. On shorter time scales, it's very stable. On these time scales, when we take bigger excursions in plunger gate voltage, we do see some, some drifts in the phase diagram. Here's an example of that. The topological gap, the protocol came back. We refound the topological phase at very similar values of plunger gate voltage and magnetic field. The gap is a little bit smaller, 22 microvolts. The air is a little smaller, but still a multiple of the topological gap squared. Now, that's great, we've observed the topological phase, but we do want larger topological gaps because the larger that gap is, the more stable ultimately the qubit will be that we build on this topological phase. So we made some changes, okay, we made some improvements. We were able to improve the dielectric process. We optimized the stack a little bit, thereby both reducing the disorder level and improving the tolerance of disorder. Here's an SEM image of the device. We actually went to a multi-gate layer design. And what we saw is this phase diagram here. And in particular, a substantial increase in the topological gap. So we now observed a maximum topological gap of around 60 microvolts. The area of the topological phase is a little bit smaller. It's a smaller multiple of that gap squared, but still a multiple of that gap squared. And so this demonstrates that in a predictable way, that by making some changes to both design and process, we can get to larger topological gaps, and that's the direction in which we're heading. This is the three terminal transport data from that device, where you can see gap closing and reopening, uh, and zero bias peaks at the two ends. For completeness, I also want to mention that our yield is not 100%. We have devices that fail the topological gap protocol. Here's an example. This is a device that in fact has stable zero bias peaks at both ends. That's what those big yellow regions on the left phase diagram are. Those are regions where we have stable zero bias peaks. And actually, aesthetically, they're very nice looking prominent zero bias peaks. However, the system is gapless there. 
again, that's why it's so important to have the non-local conductance. And you can see the phase diagram on the right, it's pretty featureless. There's not much going on there because the system is gapless everywhere there. It turns out this is a device that had slightly higher disorders levels so that density of charge impurities was a little bit higher. And so it's not totally surprising that the that it doesn't pass the topological gap protocol, but this is just a general feature. We don't have 100% yield and don't expect to have it at these kinds of disorder levels. And this is, you know, these are the, those, those cuts through the data where again, you see the zero bias peaks, but you also see the gap closes and then it just doesn't go anywhere, doesn't reopen. Looking forward, so this is the topological phase. So that was, you know, step zero. We had to be able to controllably induce the topological phase in Majorana zero modes in our devices. We've got that. This is, this is a schematic of that device. We've observed topological gaps in the 20 to 60 microvolt range. And abstractly, what we have here is a topological region in Majorana zero modes at the ends and then trivial superconductor on the sides. The simplest qubit that you can make out of a device, out of a system like this, is two of these topological strips so that we have four Majorana zero modes. Okay, and the, the, the qubit is then encoded in the parities of those Majorana zero modes. So what the Majorana zero modes enable the superconductor to do is it enables the superconductor to accommodate equally well either even or odd parity of electron number. Ordinarily, superconductors want just even numbers because the electrons pair, but the Majorana zero mode those Majorana zero modes or a pair of Majorana zero modes can accommodate that parity. And so we can either have even even or odd odd on those two topological sections. The, the qubit design also has quantum dots here, and the quantum dots are there in order to measure that parity. So the quantum dots are tunnel coupled controllably. We can turn on or off the tunnel coupling of the quantum dot to the Majorana zero modes, and the capacitance, the gate capacitance to that quantum dot shifts as a result of that tunnel coupling. And that shift is sensitive to the parity of the Majorana zero modes. Essentially, there's an interference loop that goes around from the quantum dot to one Majorana zero mode and back from the other Majorana zero mode, such that that parity shift is sensitive to the, the parity, or in other words, to the state of the qubit. And these two curves, the solid and dashed, show what the capacitance shift is for the two different Majorana zero mode parities. And by measuring the capacitance on that quantum dot, we can measure I gamma one gamma two, which is that fermion parity on the first pair of Majorana zero modes. The second quantum dot measures I gamma two, gamma three, and the third quantum dot measures I gamma three, gamma four. So we can measure those different fermion parities and thereby effectively measure fusion of Majorana zero modes by measuring capacitance shift. So by putting this all into essentially like a circuit quantum electrodynamics type of circuit, we can measure the topological properties of interest. So a device like this with two collinear topological segments enables us to measure fusion, a slightly modified device that has two parallel topological segments uh, connected by a trivial superconducting wire is a scalable type of qubit, and two of those enable us to do entanglement and braiding. As you can see, all these are dependent on the basic breakthrough of being able to reproducibly and reliably create the topological superconducting state in these devices. Is the first step on the path to a, a quantum supercomputer at scale Able, capable of solving high impact problems. It's the work of the whole team at Microsoft here over the last couple of years. I'd like to thank you for listening to this presentation and look forward to sharing more results with you soon.